Welcome back to the second video this week on syntax. Now, before we start, there's a handout that goes along with this video. So if you haven't got this already, there is a link below the video. Go and print that out. You might find that useful. Um, there will be two times during the video where we'll ask you to pause the video and work on some exercises. You'll find the instructions on the screen, but they're also contained in the handout together with some useful examples. So in the first video preceding this, we explored some of the fundamental observations of syntax, principally that syntax involves the combining of words into larger and larger phrases and ultimately into sentences, and that this combination involves the property of unboundedness. Sentences can have infinite embedding, if you will. They can be infinitely large, potentially, but also that there are certain constraints with regards to what we can combine and in what order we can combine things. So we'll use that as a starting point for this video, where rather than just looking at English like we have done in the first video, now we'll be looking at variation across all the world's languages in a small domain, namely in the nominal projection or in the noun phrase, a phrase that consists of things like a determiner, a demonstrative, something like that or those, a numeral like one, two, and three, an adjective like green, blue, or yellow, and a noun like orange, zoo, pen, or pendant, perhaps. So when we look at a noun phrase across languages, first of all, we can observe that there is something that is universal to it, namely, in all the words languages, we have these items that we just enumerated. It's a universal of language that noun phrases consist of the items demonstrative, numeral, adjective, and noun. Conversely, what is language specific is the relative order of these items within the noun phrase. So for example, while in English we have demonstrative, numeral, adjective, noun, so for example we would say something like dos three green apples. In Spanish we have the order demonstrative, numeral, noun, adjective, so we would say something like dos three apples green. In Burmese we have the order demonstrative, noun, adjective, numeral. So we would say something like dos, apple, green, three. And in Basque, we have numeral, noun, adjective, demonstrative. So there we would say three, apples, green, those. So what this means for us is that on the one hand, we need to account for these universal aspects of language in that the same items are combined into the same kind of phrase. But on the other hand, our account also must be flexible enough that we can account for all these various orderings that we find in all these different languages, and they might seem at the moment quite radically different. However, there is some systematicity to it. It's not a matter of anything goes. I can't just get any random order if I look at enough languages. In fact, it turns out that some orders are completely unattested, and in fact, what we might call unattestable. That means the human mind, for some reason, seems incapable of learning those orders. So it turns out that this distribution of the various items that we find within the noun phrase has been quite extensively studied by linguists. First and foremost, Joseph Greenberg is responsible for what we know now as Universal 20, which is an observation that he came up with studying a vast sample of the world's languages and the distribution of these various items in those languages. So here's what Universal 20 says very briefly. When any or all of the items, demonstrative, numeral, and adjective precede the noun, then they are always found in that order. So when we have demonstrative, numeral, and adjective before the noun, then it's always stem, num, a, n. However, if they follow the noun, then the order is either the same or its exact opposite. So we can get n, dem, num, a, or we can get n, a, num, dem. This was the principal observation that Joseph Greenberg made when he came up with this Universal 20, and this has piqued the interest of quite a few linguists, and people have very extensively studied this to try and find out whether there are really only those ordering possibilities, 
and also to try and explain why the orders may be so restricted in that way. So essentially then what we have to explain here is a cross-linguistic distribution. We want to explain why certain orderings are possible in different languages but other orders are impossible in all languages. So let's have a look at a couple of examples of these orders in languages where they are attested. So first of all, of course, let's look at English, which we are very well familiar with. In English, we have the order demonstrative numeral adjective noun. So we have something like these five public employees. So we find the exact opposite of English in, for example, a language called Ogungbe, which is a language spoken in Nigeria and Western Africa. So here in Gungbe, if we look at the subpart of the sentence, tavo is a noun, so we have noun, and then we have the adjective rajo and hoho, big old, so we have adjective next, and then we have aton, which is a numeral, so we have the numeral next, and then we have ehe, which is a demonstrative. So this meaning something like table, big old, and then some number and some demonstrative. So what we can see here is that English, of course, confirms to this order that Greenberg said we will find if the items occur before the noun, where the noun is last, and then we have this very fixed order. And then behind the noun, he said, we can either find the same order or the exact opposite. So here in Gungbe, we have found the exact opposite. However, it's not the case that whenever you find some order in some language, you can go and just reverse that and you'll find another possible language. So for example, let's have a look at the language Kitaraka, which is a Bantu language spoken in Kenya. In Kitaraka, we find that we have the noun first and then following this, we have the same order as in English. So this is the other possibility that Greenberg talked about, noun, demonstrative, numeral and then adjective. And don't worry about the prefixes here that have been transcribed with this numeral eight. This is something we call a classifier. It's kind of like gender marking that occurs in Bantu languages and they have a very extensive system of that. Fun thing to Google, but we won't worry about it. However, what is missing from the empirical record is a reverse Kitaraka. So a language in which we find an order like adjective, numeral, demonstrative, noun. So this would be a sentence like green three these apples. This is completely unattested. There is no language in the world that has that order. And for all we know, human beings are unable to learn a hypothetical language that contains that order. So let's have a look at the complete paradigm of Universal 20 and all those orders that are theoretically possible. And then we divide them into those orders that we actually find in the world's languages and those orders that are completely unattested. So what we see here are all the theoretical orders that I could put these four items in. And the items that we find here in white text on a darker background are the ones that we can't find across the world's languages. So the orders a, dem, num, n, orders a, dem, n, num, n, num, dem, a, num, n, dem, a, and all the orders given in column four here are unattested across the world's languages. And what we want to explain then essentially is how it is that humans are able to make all the orders that we find that are attested, but that no language is able to make those orders that we've just crossed out. So in order to explain this, it turns out we have to dive in a little deeper than just looking at the kinds of phrases that we can combine and what their categories are. We have to think about the processes that build phrases and manipulate phrases in the human mind. So let's go ahead and make a couple of assumptions about those kinds of processes and see how we fare. So first of all, let's assume that syntactic phrases are formed through an operation of pairwise combination that we call merge. Then secondly, let's assume that the order in which these items, demonstrative, numeral, adjective, and noun combined is fixed universally. That means every human being that is born in the world is endowed with the set order of combining these items. The noun is combined with the adjective first, then the numerals are added, and finally, the demonstrative is added on top of this. Now, the third assumption that we're going to make is that in every pairwise combination, languages can choose different linearizations. That is, a language can choose, for example, when it adds the adjective to the noun, whether to put the adjective onto the right-hand side of the noun or onto the left-hand side of the noun. So the kinds of structures that we're building here, you can think of a little bit like a mobile, like you might hang it above a child's crib where you can spin the various items that are hanging on it, 
without really changing the structure, the order in which these items have been combined, yet the linear order, the relative positioning of these items to one another can change. So let's have a look how we might use merge and this different linearization parameter that we have to build various kinds of phrases. So our first step here is combining green and apples, an adjective and a noun, we get the phrase green apples if we put the adjective on the left of the noun. Then the second step is we could add a numeral. So if we add the numeral three, we can again add that to the left or the right. Here we choose to the left. So we get three green apples. Now if I want a different order, I can do something like this. First step, I insert green to the right of apples. So now I have apples green. Then in the second step, I can also insert the numeral to the left or the right. Here I choose the right and I get apples green three. So I can produce the opposite order of items even though I combine items in the same sequence and I build the same hierarchical structure as before, just swung the opposite way around. And of course, I can keep doing that and put one item left, one item right, one item right, one item left, whatever I desire. And that way I can build quite a few orders. So this is exactly what I'm going to ask you to do now. So I'm going to give you a little task. Namely, I'll give you the task, try and come up with all the possible orders that you can make just using this methodology of merging these items in a fixed order and then putting them left or right. So I'm going to put the instructions for the task on the screen. I want you to pause the video, take about five minutes or so, and try and come up with as many orders of these as you can, and then resume the video and we'll go through a solution. We'll look at how we can make all these various orders that we have here. Of course, these instructions, examples, and everything is also contained on the handout for today. So if you've printed that, you can just work on the handout and I will see you in about five minutes. So I hope you've given it a good go. You might not have found all of the orders, but that's entirely okay. All that counts is that you have a good go and try and get familiar with this method of combining things and putting them into structures and drawing these syntactic trees. So let's have a go at trying to come up with these eight orders that I said you should be able to find. So the first of these is order 1a, the monstrative numeral adjective and noun, and we do this this way. First we combine the noun and then we put the adjective to the left, then we put the numeral to the left, and then we put the demonstrative to the left. Then order 2a, we get if we put the adjective to the right, the numeral to the right, and then the demonstrative to the right. Order 1b, we get if we put the adjective to the right, then the numeral to the left, and the demonstrative to the left. Order 2b, we get if we put the adjective to the left, and then the numeral to the right, and the demonstrative to the right. So you can already tell I have quite a systematic way of deriving these things here. I come up with some order, flip something, and then produce the mirror image of that. So keeping going, perhaps slightly less intuitive, I find order 1c, where I put the adjective to the left, the numeral to the right, and then the demonstrative to the left. The mirror image of that is 2c, where I put the adjective to the right, the numeral to the left, and then the demonstrative to the right. For order 1d, I put the adjective to the right, the numeral to the right, and then the demonstrative to the left. Then again, I get the mirror image to that, which is 2D, where I put the adjective to the left, the numeral to the left, and then the demonstrative to the right. So this accounts for all the possible orders in column one and column two of our table, where column two, of course, is always the exact inverse of column one, but we haven't been able to account for the items in column three yet. It turns out to account for the items in column three, we need to introduce another process that we call movement. So suppose that at any point in the process of building phrases, a language may choose to recombine the current structure with an element already contained inside of it. This is what we call movement. Now, in addition to just stating what movement is, we also need to make a couple of assumptions to restrict movement. So let's first of all assume that within a noun phrase, only the noun can be moved. Let's then assume that movement is always to the left. So I can't move things to the right, I can always move them to the left. So to illustrate how movement can give us additional order, let's try and pick one from the third column. Let's go with 3a, which is the order n, dem, num, a. So to get this order, again, we start with the noun, and then we add the adjective, which we add to the left. Then next, as per our universal merge order, we have to add the numeral, which again, we're going to add to the left. So we have num a n at this point, and now we add the demonstrative again to the left. 
So we have something like those three green apples, stem, num, a, n, which of course is the wrong order. We want the noun first. So what we do now is we move the noun to the left. And we assume here that the lowest copy of the noun is unpronounced. So when we have moved something, the lowest copy in the structure is not pronounced. So we get apple stoves three green. So what I would like you to do is to pause the video again for about five minutes and see if using movement with these constraints that you're only allowed to move the noun, you can come up with three further orders that I'm going to put on the screen now. So I'll see you back in five minutes. So well done on giving this a good go. If you've been able to come up with all three, congratulations. If you haven't, don't worry about it. We go through them now. So what we see here is that to get order 3b, we start with combining the noun and the adjective. We put the adjective to the left. We put the numeral to the left. And then we move the noun up. And then we put the demonstrative on top of that. So the counterintuitive new thing here is that we do the movement first, and then we add the demonstrative. Now to get order 3D, we put the adjective to the left, the numeral to the left, then do the same, move the noun up, put the demonstrative on top, but this time we just put the demonstrative to the right, and we get the order n num a dem. To get order 3A, we again put the adjective to the left, then put the numeral to the right, the demonstrative to the left, and our last step is going to be to move the noun to the top, and we get the order n dem a num. So you might have also noticed, and perhaps you've tried even to come up with them, that there are two orders that we still haven't been able to account for, namely orders 3C and 3F. To derive those orders, we need to slightly loosen our requirement of what can be moved. And instead of saying we can just move the noun, now actually we have to say we can move any subgroup of the noun phrase that contains the noun. So what we move has to be a phrase a combination that is made with merge that contains the noun. If we allow this, we can now make those two structures. Now this process of something when it's moving in the syntactic tree, taking something else along with it, is called pied piping, after the legend of the pied piper of Hamelin, who playing on his magic flute was able to draw out all the rats of the town and then of course later on the people didn't want to pay him and so he went and did the same and took all the children out of the town to either the grief or the relief of the parents whichever way it might have been. So to build order 3c here we start by putting the adjective to the left, the numeral to the left, the demonstrative to the left and now we take this whole unit of adjective and noun and we move it to the left and we get the adjective and the noun first so we get adjective, noun, demonstrative, numeral. And of course, again, this lower copy is not pronounced. To make order 3F, we put the adjective to the right, the numeral to the left, and the demonstrative to the left. And then again, we move the whole group of noun and adjective to the top, and we get the noun and the adjective first. So noun, adjective, demonstrative, numeral. And again, the lower copy of these items is not pronounced. So now with just these two processes, with merge and move, and then, of course, with our universal restriction or ordering of how we combine items, the idea that it can go left or right, and the idea that we can pipe pipe things along when we move the noun, we can make all the orders that are attested. But the crucial question, of course, really is, why can't we make those orders that are unattested with the system? So there are two things that prevent us from using these tools to make the unattested structures. First of all, we saw that movement has to be leftward. And you can ask yourself, what would go wrong if I allowed movement to the right? So look at the two structures that we've been building, for example, by moving the noun and the adjective at the end. If I was allowed to move the things to the right there, then I would get some of the orders that are shaded, some of the orders that are unattested. Second of all, we've required that movement always must contain the noun, this first item that we're introducing into the noun phrase. And nothing can be moved if it doesn't contain at least the noun. So again, you can ask yourself, well, what would go wrong if I didn't include the noun in the thing that I move? So if I could move the adjective or the numeral or the demonstrative by itself, or perhaps I could just move the demonstrative and the numeral at will. Well, in that case, I could get orders where the things don't stay together, where they don't stay combined. I could build a structure 
that has the noun, the adjective, the numeral, then demonstrative, and then in the last minute move the adjective out of its place and thereby again produce orders that are unattested. So it's really those two restrictions that account for all the things that are shaded and it's perhaps a nice exercise to do in your own time to go through each of these shaded orders and think about which of these two rules you would break if you were to try and derive that order. So from this study of Universal 20 of the ordering across languages of these items demonstrative, numeral, adjective and noun we have learned quite a lot about the human capacity for syntax, about the human syntactic system. We've seen that strings of words form hierarchical binary branching structures through this combination with the function merge. We've seen that the order of combination of the noun phrase is universally noun before the adjective, before the numeral, before the demonstrative. And we've seen that movement recombines an already formed structure with its root, with the most deeply embedded item in that phrase. And then we've seen that movement must always be towards the left, because if we allow movement towards the right, we would predict that there are languages that do not exist, that are not attestable. Now finally, we've seen that movement in the noun phrase must always include the noun. So these are quite impactful insights about what it means for these processes to be universal. Looking at these processes across languages, they really tell us that no human that walks around on Earth has processes in their mind and brain, ultimately, that violate these restrictions that we've explored here. All the human beings share some common structure, some common processes, and some common ways of combining these items that lead to these universal patterns. Now, going on from learning more about the structure and the processes that are involved in building sentences, in the third video, we'll explore in a little bit more depth how we can test whether something actually isn't constituent. Constituents are the kinds of things that, for example, I was able to move here, the noun and the adjective, together, whilst I couldn't move, for example, the noun and the numeral, even though they might be linearly next to each other, I couldn't move them. So we need some tests to figure out what things are constituents that could be moved and grouped together. We'll do that in the next video. And then we'll also be looking at the relationships that these various items in a syntactic structure can have with one another at dependencies between items.